What's up? It's Matt Plapp. We're back with another restaurant expert roundup. Last time I was on here last Tuesday, I was in a much better place. I was on the sunny beach in Miami Beach. Today I'm in Cincinnati. It's cold. It's dreary. But I'm with the restaurant boss, Ryan. What's going on? What's up, boss? How are you? I'm amazing. I mean, I was better last week when I was in the sun in Miami talking to uh, the, the pizza champ on the beach, but I guess I'll settle for the gloomy, the uh, cold Cincinnati right now. I, I just got off a team meeting with a brand that I work with in the Cincinnati, Ohio, Kentucky area. They said it was a little chilly out there, but that's hilarious that we literally went from one call to another in Cincinnati. Yeah, I'm Cincinnati, and then I go home in about an hour, and I'm in northern Kentucky, so I'll, I'll be both places. So do you live, like, in the Covington area, or? I live in Union, Kentucky, which is about 10 minutes. So tell the audience who you are, and then let's dig into you and the business. So my name is Ryan Gromfin, and I, uh, I have this small little company I call The Restaurant Boss, and I coach independent restaurant owners how to make more money and enjoy more freedom. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. How long have you been in the business and what, what got you into being a restaurant coach? So I've been in the food and beverage business. I mean, it's all I've ever done. It's all I've known. I mean, first job, 15 years old, my mom had to drive me to a country club that I was cooking. And you can imagine how the cooks felt when they found out that my mom was dropping me off at the first job. The nicknames, the nicknames started fast. But I mean, it's all, it's all I've ever done is, is cook and, and operate restaurants. And now it's been... 10 years that I've been coaching restaurants and I've coached restaurants all over the country, all over the world. So yeah. it's a lot of fun. So let's talk about the first topic there because that you mentioned freedom. Sure. I'm pretty adamant that my employees build into their life and even friends of mine and other businesses, they need to build in ways to get out of the business and go do stuff like you, this, Last week I was in Miami at a conference getting coached, but I took two days off and I, you know, during the conference, those three days, my company ran. Uh, I didn't do a whole lot. My employees ran it, you know, including, you know, Doug behind me and the team that was here earlier. You know, this Friday I'm going on a four day ski trip with my daughter and her boyfriend. I won't work at all. And then the following week I'm in Florida for Christmas for a week and my company will run. There's not a lot of restaurant owners that can mentally get out of their box, but also, Probably physically. How, how do you coach them to do that? So obviously a restaurant business is a little more complex and I never want people to think that that some of us who coach and consult and in the expert industry are standing on soap boxes and just saying, well, we could do it and so can you. Yeah. So I always want to let people know that, you know, I have been there and I have been able to go from the stress and struggle and overwhelm of operating restaurants and there's a whole story you can hear another time about me in the emergency room because I didn't have any time off for eight months. We opened up four restaurants in a period of about eight, nine months. And it ended with me in the emergency room under an MRI or a CAT scan. I don't know the difference, but it ended up with me there at three o'clock in the morning with a question that the doctor asked me, which is basic. You need to take two weeks off. I'm like, well, is there like a surgery or a pill or what I could do? He's like, no, it's like you need to take two weeks off. You need to chill out. And I'm, I literally, I'm like, how am I supposed to do that? I have four restaurants that are barely operating with me working seven days a week, 12, 14 hours a day. And you want me to take two weeks off. Now I did get to take those two weeks off about six months later when I went on a trip to Fiji for a Tony Robbins event. Yep. But um, That was the goal. The end of the year, within the six months, I wanted to get to Fiji and go on that trip. And so that's how I got into consulting was what I learned through that period of time. The again, I'm always careful here because I don't, I don't ever want to sound like I'm just like preaching. But it but no, really does come down to its systems, its processes, its procedures, and sometimes we rely so heavily on people. And again, I don't ever want to say anything like the people that you're working for can't handle it, or people in general can't handle it. But really, what it comes down to is. It's systems. It's systems that require people to operate, but it's systems. If you don't have the systems in place, if you are relying on your people to figure things out or to remember to do things, that's going to be the biggest difference between you being able to take a day, a week, two weeks off, and you being in the restaurant every day. If you're the only person who knows how to do things and you find yourself saying, like, 
How come I'm the only person who knows how to do this? I can't believe I can't find people who can do this. I hired this GM who spent 10 years working at some big corporate chain, a Chili's and Applebee's and Olive Garden. And then you think that by hiring them, they're going to come in and build all these systems and processes and procedures for your restaurant. But in reality, the person who builds the systems is very different than the person who follows the systems. And so sometimes we're putting the wrong people in the wrong places. It's not that the GM who has 20 years of experience that you hired is not doing a good job for you. It's just that we're asking them to do a job that they're not capable of doing. The person who rides the horse in the Kentucky Derby is not the trainer, is not the trainer. The person who trains the horse doesn't get on and ride it. And the person who rides it doesn't train it. The person who builds the airplane doesn't fly it. And so again, it's a lot of this is about systems where we run into the challenges where I like to think that I can add a lot of value to anyone out there uh, in the restaurant industry is that's what I help people do. I help teach people how to build those systems, how to create that freedom through systems, processes, procedures, rules, et cetera. Yeah. And, and systems are, are there and they're there to be used, but they're also, you know, they're what give you freedom. And like, as you said earlier, I, I'm the same way. I always tell a lot of my clients, like, you know what? I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that you can do what I do because I don't run a restaurant. I run a marketing firm, a consulting firm. But I can also say that five years ago, every single thing in our business ran through Matt Plapp. When I left, when I left anywhere, went out of town, my cell phone blew up with email, text, phone from restaurant owners. That's my business. And we have a couple hundred nationwide. And I had to figure out how to get myself out of the way because what you said there is this right here. I used to always say, how come I'm the only one that can do this for the client? And it was, I looked at it and I, I remember literally, I had a friend of mine who said that exact same. I want you to ask yourself this question, Matt. What are all your problems? Well, we need to do this. We need to do this. Well, how come you're the only one who can do it? And I thought, and I said, because I never showed anybody. Right. I never wrote it down. I never put it in a, in a, a manual. And a, a buddy of mine who's a client that owns two burger restaurants uh, was telling me he went to China for a month. I mean, for a month left his restaurant. He's not a big, big, big multi-conglomerates, two location burger joint, went to China for a month. And I remember him telling me that the systems he had in place, he had a manual. If we run, if a light burns out, here's how you put a new light in. There it is over there. That's what it looks like. That's the model number. This is where we reorder them from. He had it all in place that there was no issue that he could say, how come you can't do this? Because he said, the reason was I was in the way. Yep. Absolutely. And one thing I want to say here, if, hopefully this is a good time to insert this, but progress before perfection. I'd say the biggest thing that people come to me with or the challenge or the emails that I get are, what's the best program to build my systems? What's the best manual that I can buy? What's the best this? Where can I go for that? Just do it. Just do it. Just do it wrong. Just do it and you'll fix it later. Like you said, I'm sure there's probably a perfect way to write an instruction manual for how to change a light bulb. But for right now, just create a Word document that says, these are all the bulbs in our restaurant and here's a picture of this bulb and this is where we buy it on Amazon. And this bulb and this is where we buy it on Amazon. And is it perfect? No, but it's something. Yep. When you get bigger, when you get better, you'll be able to send that something to someone to make beautiful, but literally, I spent 90 minutes on a phone with a guy yesterday or last week who was like, well, I'm going to need to hire a graphics person and I'm going to need to hire this to build all these systems you're talking about. I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah. You're allowing the shit to get in the way. Just do it. Yeah. So, sorry. I, I see you wrote that up there. I love that. But that's a Brendan Burchard quote, but progress before perfection, just go out and do something. And you said another thing earlier, you might want to get ready to type this out, but no. Systems create freedom. Freedom creates value. You like can't that. sell a restaurant that doesn't have systems. You're selling used equipment. You're selling whatever time is remaining on a lease. Systems create value and value is what creates freedom. And freedom is what people want to buy. Yeah. So there's another part to that. It's systems create freedom. Freedom creates value. Value creates scale. But the point is, when someone wants to buy a restaurant or buy a business, why do people love investing in real estate? Because what they're investing in is freedom. They're investing in cash flow. They're investing into what they believe is a passive business. Income, yeah. There is activity, of course, in real estate. But the point is, 
You buy a rental property, you get it leased, you sit back, you collect the check. It's not that much work. The hard work is building up the money to buy it. But the point is for all of you who have restaurants who are wondering how you're ever going to retire or if you're going to have something to sell, you're never going to sell a restaurant. You're going to sell a system because investors will buy systems that operate. If you're selling a restaurant, your only buyer is another restaurant operator. Yeah. And restaurant operators are not walking around with millions of dollars to buy restaurants. Investors are. Investors. So I want to go back to your story earlier because I'm curious on this. You know, you, you mentioned you were opening four restaurants over nine months, didn't take care of yourself. And that led you to the emergency room. And I, I bring this up to a lot of people. You know, I'm a, I'm a big person. Like my after this, I go to the gym. Uh, I'm not perfect in the gym. I'm not perfect in nutrition. But I've noticed that I run better when I take those hours a day out of my time uh, to work out, to go for a walk, to maybe eat a different type of meal. In the restaurant world, I've always said, man, that's got to be the hardest when it comes to your body. Because like me, when I'm in a great mood, it's like I want a giant cheeseburger, french fries, and a Mountain Dew. When I'm in a terrible mood, I want a giant cheeseburger and a Mountain Dew. And if I'm in a restaurant... Like I had a client of mine that had uh, four locations that I was in all the time. That's how I got in the restaurant marketing world years back. But I remember going to their restaurant and sitting a, a 10 feet from the Mountain Dew dispenser. And like that was my weakness. And I would just literally lean back and be like, and it was tough. So like restaurant owners have that, like most businesses, like an office business, I just got to battle maybe the exercise part. But as an operator, you got to battle that kitchen and battle what's quick, what's easy, what's fast. I'm guessing that's probably what led you to the hospital was a combination of stress, overwork, and probably eating and drinking the wrong stuff. Am I right? So partially, yes. You can tell by right now I'm not in the best shape of my life. Actually, what's funny is back then I was actually in pretty decent shape. Now, I was younger. I would eat the chicken tenders. Diet Coke was my addiction. But honestly, at the time, it wasn't the eating. It was the stress and the struggle. Oh. It, it absolutely was. I was killing myself. But but I've 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 been known to put that extra chicken tender in the fryer when you're when you're cooking and it's eight o'clock on a Saturday night you haven't eaten in six or seven hours it's it's easy to drop that fourth chicken tender and then the struggle is how long do you let it cool off and and what risk do you take eating it hot because if you just let it sit there and cool off you're gonna get in trouble so you usually <laughs> end up eating it when it's crazy hot <laughs> yeah I pulled some uh, I was down at a place a client of ours called Black Rock uh, down in Fort Lauderdale I was down there. That's four nights ago eating dinner and they came out with this shrimp that was in the, the on top of a 700 degree lava rock on a little skillet in there and there was no silverware and i was hungry and so i grabbed it he's like matt like that's not very cool like, that's hot and i'm like sorry i was hungry but how, how do you advise your your clients because there those are three three things that i can that can kill you all three or one i mean stress is crazy uh, working yourself too much is really easy in the restaurant business and then eating poorly in the restaurant. How do you talk to your clients about teaching them to really step out of the restaurant, take an hour break, chill out? So you're going to have to remind me as I go because I have a very short term memory. So let's talk about stress first. Then you have to remind me what the other two were because I already forgot about it. I'm thinking about stress. But for me, stress is really it's a deviation of a goal or an expectation. So I know this is on video. So if you think about it, the only time that we're stressed out is when we have an expectation to be somewhere, or there we go, to be somewhere at a certain point in time and currently we're not on a path. That's when we get stressed out, right? Like if you're six years old, you don't get stressed out about one day getting your driver's license because you just, every day you're going to get older, you're going to get a driver's license sooner or later. Now, maybe when you're 15 and a half and you start thinking about the test, but there's no point about stressing out about turning 16. You're on the path. You just wake up every day and you're a day closer to turning 16 or 18 or 21 or whatever it is. But when we get stressed out, it's because something is out of line. Either we have an expectation that we're not on the path for, or I guess that's really it. It's we have the expectation, but we're either the expectation is wrong or the path is wrong. So the first thing I like to do in like a strategy session is, find out what, what is the expectation. Like you say you're not as far along on this journey as you want to be, or you're stressed out because of this or because of that. So what is the expectation? That's the first thing. Where, where do you think you should be 
And then what we do is we assess where you're at right now and we put together a plan to get there. And honestly, well, there will always be a little bit of stress because if there's financial trouble or anything else, when we get on the path, when we know that we're moving toward a goal, that stress subsides dramatically. And that's what it was for me. It was I had this expectation that my restaurant was supposed to have a certain sales number or a certain volume or I was supposed to have more freedom or whatever it was in my life. But then when you opened up my calendar and looked at it, like Tony Robbins says, show me your calendar, I'll predict your future, right? My calendar was not made up of the activities that support the goal that I wanted. So what I always ask people to do is think about what your goal is and then open up your calendar. If your calendar is blank, you're reacting to everything. Yeah. You have no plan. You're just reacting. You and I, I don't remember if it was recorded or not, but right maybe at the beginning of this call or right when the call started, we talked about alarms going off and calendars for a minute because you and I live off of a calendar. I live off of my calendar. So what I try to do every year is set a goal. And then every quarter we break those goals down to monthly and weekly. And then we put it in the calendar and all I do every day, I'm a slave. Literally. I'm like, I come up with, I don't know who's out there, but I'm a, I'm a weird dude. I, I come up with these analogies of like these like weird, like dominatrix, whatever. But like, I am a sub to my calendar. I am submissive to my calendar. Take that for as much fun or jovial as you want to be. But every Friday before I play golf, and I play golf every Friday unless I'm behind on a task, but every Friday afternoon before I leave, the last thing I do, I set up my calendar for the next week based on my yearly goals, my quarterly goals, and my monthly goals. I set it up in my calendar, and then I execute the plan. I wake up every morning. I look at my calendar. Before I go to sleep at night, I look at my calendar, and I execute the plan. And then if I'm off on the week, well, then that slush fund, that five hours on Friday afternoon, golf is gone, which is my reward. And now I have to work. But I do not end a week without accomplishing my goals for the week. I like it. I'm writing a book and I'm, I was a little bit behind last week in a little section. So Sunday afternoon, I took an hour off from time with my family. I came into my office and I wrote the section I needed to write because I was gonna have that section done by the end of the week. And if you execute your weekly goal, which is part of your monthly goal, which is part of your quarterly goal, which is part of your yearly goal, you're gonna hit your yearly goal. And then you're gonna hit your five-year goal. And then you're gonna hit your 10-year goal. But we're stressed out because we're thinking 10 years in advance. Stop thinking 10 years in advance. Just think about the next task. Sorry, I get really passionate about it. No, I, I love it. What, one of my son's friends the other day put a little uh, a story on Instagram, and he was being funny, but it was kind of – it was realistic. He's like, how do you add 20 pounds to your bench? And he walked over and put a 10 on each side and put – add 10s. And, you know, I, I look at it. A lot of people ask that. How do I get to this task? Well, how do you get there? And, like, you know, for example, exercise. Like, my, my phone – I have it scheduled every day of the week what time I'm working out. It's non-negotiable. My golf league on Tuesdays is in my phone, blocked out. Uh, I just got done doing this. This is my coach I was in Cal in Florida with last week. This is a schedule of the next 12 months. Yep. Got already booked up here my eight vacations. I've got the three times I'm going to Florida to see him. I've got every one of my weekends, my son has a football game scheduled, and I've got my two, my daughter's two cheer events I have to go. They're already I'm in there. I'm pretty sure I know what coach you work with. <laughs> and so I've, I've got it all in there, and but also I've got goals that go along with that. And so on a daily basis, I know what metrics get me to success on a weekly, monthly, quarterly, annual basis. But I think a lot of businesses, you know, I, when I left Florida, I had – this stacks of notes. I'm a, I have a habit when I go to events, I have the small piece of paper, I write notes and then I schedule a day when I'm done and I take those notes and I put them and I categorize them. And then I put it on a Google sheet and I assign it to people, put dates on it and we're good to go. But I, a lot of those have like, Hey, I want to save this much money. I want to go on this vacation. I want to lose this much weight. You know, I want my bit, my restaurant to grow by this much. You know, what are you doing to get there? And a lot of times, like you need to schedule on your calendar. I told a restaurant the other day, we were talking about growing the business. And I said, you know, there's at the end of the day, growing your revenue comes down to how many people know you, like you, and trust you, but also how many people you invite in. 
And I said, how are you inviting them in? So for example, there's nothing holding you back from getting on the phone and calling your top 20 customers every week and saying, hey, what's going on? Having a conversation. You send them emails, send them text messages, making Facebook posts, comment on Facebook posts. But you know what? If you don't schedule it, it's not going to happen. We had a rule. This is hilarious because as as the guy that was working seven days a week, 15 hours a day, my wife and I operated those four restaurants together. Yep. She did a lot of the back end work and I was the chef and the general manager and the everything. Um, but one of the restaurants that we operated was like a wine country market, bistro, a really nice place for lunch and dinner. And every day at like 12, 1230, my wife would come into the restaurant and sit down and have a server fill up her iced tea for her and bring her food and clear her plate. And I'm like throwing things in the kitchen. Like, I can't believe you're just sitting in the diner. So one day in a fit of rage, I'm like, you want to sit and have lunch in the dining room? You can eat in the dining room whenever you want. And you can order anything you want on the menu, but you need to have someone sitting with you. She's like, who? I'm like, I don't care who go to the, cause we were in a mall. I'm like, go to Macy's and get the makeup girl to have lunch with you. I don't care. But if I'm, if we're wasting resources to give you food in a table, you need to be having some, or someone needs to be sitting with you. So she, out of spite to me, went to the Macy's makeup counter with a girl that she would buy her makeup from, invited her to lunch the next day. They sat down in the restaurant, had lunch, and something magical happened. Matt, what do you think happened? I, I actually don't know. She booked a quinceanera with us. Oh, there you go. She sold something. Yeah. Specifically, but... Literally, the woman was like, wow, I've never eaten here, even though it's across the hall. The food's great. Do you do catering? My wife's like, yes, we do. Well, my sister's having a quinceanera in like a month, and we haven't really found a great caterer. We booked a party, yeah. like 25 or 30 people. And then I was like, that worked. Oh, my God. And so that was the rule. If my wife wanted to have lunch in the restaurant, and it got to a point where people wanted to get on her calendar. Like she was having lunch with the mayor, the police chief, the fire chief, like Having lunch with my wife at the restaurant was like the hottest thing you could do in town. We were in a much smaller town, but it was crazy. They would sit down and have lunch and then book parties with us. And then have, then they would come in that weekend with their friends and they would come to our wine dinner. So what you said about inviting, we overcomplicate this. Are there methods? Yes. And I've got, if you're interested, I've got the nine step process for filling your restaurants. But don't even overcomplicate it. Just go out and invite people. Ask them. Call up a friend that hasn't eaten your restaurant in a while and say, I'm buying you lunch today. You will be shocked at what that does for you. I was telling some restaurants. I've been around uh, BNI, Business Network International, my whole life. And I was telling a couple of restaurants. I'm like, man, go out and find a BNI chapter and meet at your restaurant at 10 a.m. Oh, well, it's a headache. It's this and that. I'm like, no. They all eat. And they all have one-to-ones all the time. I said, think about it. If you have 10 people, 20 people. It's so angry because I have these same conversations. I'm like, they, they come back. I said, if, if somebody invites me, like I had a client of mine kind of just goes off the beat. I had a client of mine said, Matt, anytime you want to have lunch here for business, it's on the house. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not doing that. He goes, no, it is. He's like, here's why. You're going to bring the right person. That yep. person is going to come here with you. That day they're going to go, that was pretty good. They're going to be back in two days. And he told me, he said, literally after about three or four weeks, he goes, Matt, I see that person every time within a week at the restaurant. Yeah. And it happens quickly because now there's the reciprocity. Yeah. Yep. It happens so quickly. And I mean, there's a million stories I can share with you, but um, another one really quick and I'll, I'll make this quick is we had a terrible experience. It's just, we messed up. A, a woman picked up dinner for her and her husband we got the call a half hour later, right before we closed, that we put the wrong appetizer or forgot an appetizer, or whatever it was. And I kind of knew who this woman was. I'd recognize her. And I just said, you know what? Throw all that food out or put it in your fridge. I don't care. But where do you live? And she told me, I'm like, that's kind of on my way home. I'm just going to bring you a whole new meal. So that way you can have a fresh, warm meal. I drove it to her house, brought a bottle of champagne. The next day, she's in the restaurant for lunch with like five girlfriends. And not just like, oh, this is the restaurant I was telling you about last night. No, Ryan, come here. Meet my friend. Meet my friend. Meet my friend. Meet my friend. And they're like, I can't believe you did that. That's so amazing. She told me about it last night. And then within like a week, all five of her girlfriends were in with their husbands and their friends. And I kid you not, within a couple of months, I swear, I think that $50 or $50 of dinner, that $10 of food and $10 in a bottle of champagne that cost me probably equated to five to $10,000 in sales. Yep. 
So your quinceanera story took me back the days. We had a boat dealership for 10 years and my dad was the, everybody loved my dad. My dad's a 30 year old version, 30 year old, more version than me, he's 673, turned 74 in a couple months. And he's just like me. He's hyper exaggerated, a great guy. And people loved it. He's like the big teddy bear everybody liked. So people would always invite him to go fishing. And so I remember saying, you know what? You're as good on a fishing boat with a person than as you are in the dealership. Because I can guarantee you that poor guy that's taking you fishing is buying a new boat within a week. And it was, it was comical because that became like the joke. Like everybody wanted to go fish because we had all the coolest equipment. We had all, with all this. He had connections to pro fishermen and people would always take dad out. And it was like, well, you better be prepared. That means you're buying a new boat in a week. And sure right, enough, you're going to take dad out to dinner. It's going to cost you a hundred bucks. Now yeah. dad's going to invite you on the boat. And then the boat's going to cost you 30 grand. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> The so, most expensive dinner you ever took dad out on. <laughs> so the other other topic there was was workload. Uh, I know a lot of my clients and a lot of friends that work in the restaurant business. It's tough to get out of because you know there's an open. If you if you're open for lunch, that really means you open at probably eight a.m. Somebody's open in the restaurant, and if you're open for dinner until ten eleven, you're probably there till midnight one o'clock closing it. And a lot of owners just get stuck in that habit of like the old. I'm the only one that can do it or I can do it better. How do you coach them to get out of that mindset that it's okay to not be there every waking hour? I don't want to coach them out of that mindset. I want to coach them. I want the same experience that you get when you go to the gym. I want you to go to the gym and feel good after you went to the gym. And now you coach yourself into going to the gym again. So first thing, I don't want to coach them out of a mindset that they have to be there. I want them to earn the trust and believe that it can be done without them there. And so a lot of it is just creating new habits. So one of the exercises I like to do with people is after we've kind of figured out their goal and the path that they're on, and then we kind of write a new path to get there, is then we say, make a list of everything that frustrates you, everything that makes you angry, everything that frustrates you, everything that you want to yell and scream about, but don't, everything that you have yelled and screamed about, just anything that we can get onto this list. And then I'll have them go back and I'll say, I want you to circle what you believe is the absolute most frustrating thing. Now, the problem with this is people put things that are too big on the list. They don't chunk it down. So that's one of the things that a great coach will help, as you know, is we'll take that really big idea and help you chunk it down. Like someone will say, we're not making enough money. Well, we're not making enough money is really, it's not that you're not making enough money. It's a hundred other things that aren't being done well that make up the reason you're not making enough money. So then we'll then take that idea and I'll chunk it down into those 100 or 80 or 50 things. Then we'll pick one and fix it. And then pick the next one and fix it. And then pick the next one and fix it. And then before you know it, you freed up some time in your schedule. Now it's the flywheel theory. So what happens here is if you've got someone who's already working six days a week, seven days a week, 14 hours a day, asking them to spend an hour fixing something is like, you gotta be crazy, I can't work anymore. Well, I'm going to need you to work a little more for about a month or two, right? It's the flywheel. It's the carousel. When you get that carousel spinning, it's rusty and the bearings haven't been oiled in 20 years and your kid's like, faster, daddy, faster. And you're pushing with everything you got. And then you finally get one rotation. Well, now that it's made a rotation, you've broken free all that rust and everything. You can just sit there and have a conversation. And with one hand, you can keep that carousel or whatever, that merry-go-round, whatever it's called spinning, right? Same as a flywheel takes a ton of energy to get it spinning, but once it's spinning, it starts going. So you might have to work a little more for a few weeks, but you got to fix one thing. And when you fix that one thing, take that half hour that fixing that one thing freed up in your day and now fix another. And then now you have an hour and take that hour. And if you can commit to a year of not taking more time off, but using your new free time as you get it, to keep fixing things, you will see a dramatic change in your workload within not even a year, within a few months. But you got to make that commitment. I love it. It's almost like paying debt off. That if you, yeah. you you save more and spend less and pay this car payment off, well, crap, you just created two hundred fifty dollars in cash flow. And- Great analogy, because that's what like a Susie Orman or any of them will say is, you know, you got to figure out a way to pay off that first credit card. Then once you pay off that first credit card. You take all the money that was going to that credit card and you put it to your next credit card. And then you take all that money and put it to your, and if you can live the same life you were living before, 
but keep accelerating and accelerating and accelerating, you're going to pay those credit cards off really quickly. And speaking of the elder version of me, there he is, Dwayne Platt, chiming in on Facebook. Great information. Even though my dad's Facebook picture looks like a picture of my mom. So I was just going to say, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, man, dad doesn't look too good. <laughs> But dad, we got to get like Halloween uh. <laughs> and an homage to his bride. So I appreciate it. this is this is great information. I love it, and uh, now I know why they call you the restaurant boss. So tell us how what kind what's your ideal if a restaurant owner eventually sees this, which they will, because we get a lot of views on YouTube and Facebook and all those places. Who is your ideal client, and what are the things you'd love to help them with? So. Really, my ideal client is anyone who's open and willing to grow. Anyone who wants to grow, but you got to be open and willing. Um, but ideally, I, I work best and, and I, we can get the most results for someone. What I say, one to five units, one to five million. Yeah. You know, if you're at that one unit and you're ready to get to that second or third, and maybe you're afraid to make that jump, or like you said, you're overworked so much now, how are you ever going to have the time? Uh, maybe you're at that two to three units and you're just struggling to get. Now you're totally overworked and you don't have your systems and your processes, but um, I definitely work with people who are developing concepts and that's ideal. I mean, if you can get in before you've made some of the mistakes, if we can build these systems before you open, um, it's a harder conversation. It's a harder sell, of course, because I'm trying to convince people that don't have any problems yet. The, the world is pink and rosy and their glasses are crystal clear and they've got the newest, hottest concept and there's no way that anything can go wrong. Um, so I would love if you're in that situation and you want someone to take a look from the outside in to, to kind of beat you up a little bit and, and show you maybe where the world is going to slap you around, right? What does Mike Tyson say? That everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Nice. Um, but ideally, you know, you've got a restaurant, it's doing well, but you're, you're not ready or you're struggling to get to that next level, whatever that next level is for you. Cool. Love it. Yeah. So the restaurantboss.com is that the best way to connect That's with you? Perfect. The restaurantboss.com. That's it. Okay. If you want, if you heard this and you want to reach out to me directly, you can email me Ryan at the restaurantboss.com. Right. And what's the new book you've got? I'm finishing up my third book right now that comes out in, in January. I know the, the, the fun that goes into those last couple steps. What is your book and when's it coming out? So we don't have a title for it yet. I have a working title. Um, it's going to come out sometime probably end of first quarter, early second quarter next year. We're, we're finishing it up right now and we'll, we have to do some reorganizing of it and we'll get it off to the editors in the next couple of weeks here and then go from there. But um, really the goal of this book is to be kind of, I hate to say this, but the first personal development or professional development book that people in the restaurant industry read. I, my life and obviously, Matt, I mean, you're talking about coaches and seminars. I mean, you know, our lives, I, I can't speak for you, I assume, but I know for me, my life has gone on a trajectory that I had never planned. And I can chart that trajectory back to the day that I started working with a professional coach. Yep. Um, it started with Tony Robbins and, you know, uh, listening to audiobooks and in the car and then seminars and then coaches. But I can, I chart my income every year. I chart my hours off, my vacations every year. And for the last 10, 12 years since I started doing that, every year has been a growth year for me. Uh, and I owe that to an openness or to someone saying, you have to read this book. I should say a closeness on my side, but someone saying, you have to read this book. And that book changed my life forever. So I really wanted to write something for the restaurant industry that was less of a, this is how you do it and this is how you do it, and more of a opportunity. There are really amazing opportunities for you if you follow the rules to the game. And if you don't follow the rules to the game, you stick your hand in a cheese grater, it's going to grate your fingers. It's not because it's angry at you and it doesn't have a vendetta against you. Job. The restaurant industry is a machine. And if you don't follow the rules, that machine will eat you up and spit you out. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, you know, I actually ironically told my team that today we had uh, eight, eight or nine of us around the table today talking. I was out of town last week. And I said, you know, I want all of you to think about five years from now. I said, because five years ago, our agency was me and one person. Now we're almost like 30 people. And you know, five years ago, my house, my cars, my travel, my life with my family was night and day. And I pointed out to my team some of the things I've got now in my life from travel to luxuries and said, I want you to picture what five years can do for you. Because I didn't think these were possible five years ago. And in 2016, I met a guy named Billy Jean out of California. 
I hired him as a one-to-one coach for about a year and a half. And he helped me understand how to systemize my agency and systemize my business and take me out of it. Cause I was the number one employee and I don't need to be an employee. I need to be the CEO. And then I hired a guy named Chris Patterson out of Jacksonville, Florida, who helped me uh, understand how to goal plan, goal set and plan and plan my week and day and accomplish tasks. Uh, and then this year I hired a guy named Josh Nelson down in uh, Florida, in Miami, who's that's what I was just down seeing last week, who's helped me understand now how to grow our business to a new level. And I think all too often it's a lonely ride. And a lot of us, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, especially restaurant owners, don't get out of their four walls enough dealing with other restaurant owners just like them or dealing with people that have been down that path. And that, that's a, a great place to be. So I, I, that's awesome. I can't wait to see the book. Awesome. I'll share it with you. Cool. And I'll, I'll give a, a shameless plug because I just got mine on here. This, uh, the, the, the cover is all done. See if I can share it here. Can you see that now? Yeah, trippy. Restaurant marketing that works. Love it. Yeah. So it comes out in November or not. It was supposed to come out. In it comes out in January. Covers all done. The book is 90% done, but it'll be out uh, in the near future. And it's a lot of work uh, getting the book together. There's no doubt, but it's fun and uh, look forward to having it out. So I look forward to reading yours. And when I you get forward, it, I'm going to get you, make sure you get me a copy of that or send me a link when it's ready. I want to take a look at it. I'll make sure you get your copy and I want to get a copy of yours and then we'll get on here and review the book. Let's do it. Well, cool. Well, thanks for your time. Awesome you, though. I appreciate it. Restaurantboss.com, the restaurantboss.com. Reach out to him. Let him know how he can help your restaurant get more systems and more freedom and a better life. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Matt. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for having me. Yeah.